this is where it all starts. And to start this session, I'll tell you what I want to talk to you about. I want to talk to you about what's missing. Yeah, missing. What's missing from your life? You might say, wait a second, nothing's missing from my life, Tony. I'm on a roll. I'm here with you on the ultimate edge. I mean, my life is great. I'm just here because I like to improve a few things. Okay, I believe you. But if you're really honest, I bet there's something missing. And by the way, there's nothing to be embarrassed about that. We're so weird as a society. It's like we all want to be perfect. You know, something missing from my life? Nothing's missing. We try to cover it up even to ourselves. But I'll tell you how we know it. If you look around at most people's lives, there's this huge thing called stress. In fact, if you read interviews with people that do all these focus groups on politics, on business, on products, the number one emotion experienced by people in North America today, you know what it is? Anxiety. Not fear. Fear's not so bad. You know, if you get fearful, your whole body kind of gears up and then something happens. You know, either you were fearful and you were right and you have to deal with the problem, or many times the situation gets resolved and you go, man, I was fearful and I didn't need to be and the fear's gone. But anxiety is an emotion that most people carry with them every day. It's that feeling that never goes away. It never ends. It's a feeling that, man, if I don't run home and take care of all those emails and everything else, you know, it's like it just gets piling up. It's more and more and more. It's the feeling that you never completely win, that you can't let go. Maybe that you can't even fully allow yourself to enjoy, much less just achieve and succeed. See, the goal of this first session of this Hour of Power is to get you not just to realize how extraordinary your life is and appreciate what you have, but also to decide on what you want and to make it happen by making the shifts inside yourself that are necessary. But to make that happen, you're going to have to recapture what's missing. Not only what you want and what you need, but if there's one thing missing from most people's life today because of the way we live and technology, it's time. I mean, think about it. Not just time, but time for yourself. Time to actually feel. Time to not just react to the constant stimulus. Time to sit down and dream or decide, this is how I want my life to be. You know, this is what I'm committed to. This is how I'm going to live from this day forward. See, most of us are so caught up in making a living and reacting to the Crackberry or your iPhone or another set of emails or someone who's interrupting you in the middle of a conversation to take an email, you know, on their phone or the buzzing in your pocket or the stimulus of a thousand channels, all of this set of triggers, all our normal business demands, demands we have from our families. We want to take care of our families. We want to make a difference in the world and be the strongest we could possibly be. We want to achieve and succeed and be happy. And oh yeah, by the way, we got to deal with terrorism, economies that go up and down. And wow, what happened to that stock market? What happened to that real estate market? Or man, that subprime crisis. Ooh. Or you know, what's happening in my business? There's all the normal stresses of the environment and then there's how we've begun to live. And I'm here to say to you that if you will give yourself one gift, if you give yourself the gift a little bit of time to think, to feel, to be, to condition your body and mind to work together, the whole game can change. But if you don't, you can succeed like crazy. You can make it all happen and you can still feel empty. Have you been there? Well, you made everybody else feel good and you were a super dad or mom or a business person and, you know, it's all there but you still got stress. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying you're not gonna have stress in your life, but I'm saying there needs to be some time for you. Do you agree with me on this? So if you do that, you can make this psychological shift that changes life, the mental shift, the emotional shift, and the physical shift. Because after all, what are we talking about here when we talk about an extraordinary life? Let's remind you, what creates an extraordinary life no matter what's happening in our life? It's the psychology. And by the way, are you experiencing extraordinary life? Are we living in a world of extraordinary life? Extraordinary resources, yes. But depending on where you live in the world, you know, if you live in the Western world or, quote, the modern world, what you see mostly is stress. You know, I actually live all over the world in four different countries. But my primary residence, where I'm from originally, is the U.S. And, you know, here in America, we're 5% of the world's population, but we consume 80% of the world's cocaine. I mean, that tells you something's missing. <laughs> When you got to coke yourself up, drug yourself out, hype yourself up with more caffeine, distract yourself as much as you can with your iPod, your music, anything to just change your state, it's because there's some level of fulfillment that's missing. Don't get me wrong, all those things are wonderful, but they've got to be things that we don't rely on to be alive. Would you agree? 
you know, kids today are 10 times heavier than they've ever been. And when I say 10 times, I'm not exaggerating by much. We have more obese people in America and, frankly, in the Western world than any time in human history. We're not exactly starving for food. We're starving for wisdom. We're starving for fulfillment. We're starving for the emotions that we want. And so most of us turn to drugs. And it isn't always a medical drug or even an illicit drug, but rather it's the drug of food. It's the drug of distraction. It's the drug of alcohol or cigarettes or something to be able to just kind of cope with the stress that's in our life. But that doesn't mean we have a better life. It's just a break for a moment. And then we re-enter that same world. Part of my goal here with you in the ultimate edge, and even in the beginning of this session, is to set up a new game for you that you design, that you can win, and that you can condition into your system so that when things get crazy, bam, you can go there. And it doesn't require you to go to some external stimulus to feel that aliveness, or to feel fulfilled, or to feel at peace, or to feel your center. So my goal is to get you to develop a couple of simple habits to make a few simple decisions, to take a couple of actions that will begin to create a momentum for your life that will take you to the point where you will stand tall and say, I love my life. This is what I've always dreamed about. I am not willing to settle for less than I can be or share or create or give in my lifetime. And I want to take advantage of this incredible time to be alive, and I want to enjoy it to its fullest, and I want to make sure I contribute in a unique way. And 500 channels of television with nothing on but infomercials <laughs> And 8 million different forms of computers and music and email and instant messages and beepers and cell phones and, and remote access to the Internet. None of that's going to transform your life. Your life is going to change if you do nothing because life is changing so rapidly around you. Your body's going to change whether you want it to or not as time goes by. Your relationships are going to change. People are going to die. People are going to pass on. People are going to change their beliefs and values. Everything in your life is going to change. You don't have to work at change. Change is automatic. Progress is not. To get the edge, you have to decide that you're going to make progress in your life. You're going to have to decide that you're not going to be one of those people just drawn by the river, and you also can't get off the river and just sit on the side, because life keeps moving. you got to step in the river, and you got to direct your course by knowing what you want for your life. Now, why don't most people do this? Because most of us are so stressed, we never take time for the thing that's really missing, time for ourselves. I and mean, what's really missing is we don't ever contribute to ourselves. We're so busy taking care of our children and worrying about our spouses and our friends and making sure at work we're accomplishing the tasks on time. And but the last person who gets taken care of is us. And we live in a society that's supposed to be so selfish, so many people talk about, but the truth of the matter is most of us are working so hard to make sure everybody else is happy that we aren't happy within ourselves. And so I want to talk to you about what's missing. Time for you. I mean, when do we really stop and feel? I mean, really feel. Remember who we are and what we're about and what we want from our lives. Most of us never find that time. And so what happens to most of us is since we're constantly in the action of doing, you know, the old phrase, we're not human doings, we're human beings. It's kind of corny, but it's true. We don't take the time to be. And so what occurs is, out of the stress of doing constantly, competing, trying to make sure we achieve, we contribute, and take care of the family, and we make everything happen, most of us to survive look for a way to stop and distract ourselves. And so we drug ourselves. And the drug isn't always regular drugs. We don't call it drugs. We call it food. Because if you eat enough of that stuff and load up, guess what happens? All of a sudden, you relax. You know, especially if you overeat, all that blood rushes into your stomach, you know, and... Ah, you start to breathe again. Do you ever notice when you're going, go, 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 go like this, you're not breathing very much? That creates just a bit of stress. And some people, that's not enough. They get CNN, and then they're working on the Internet simultaneously, and they're getting a conversation on the other side because they figure if they can keep enough things going in their head, they can forget about all the stuff that's stressing them. You know, they don't even care about what's on the television. They don't really care about what they're surfing on the net. They just need an escape. But, you know, you'll never escape your way to fulfillment. You'll never escape your way to joy. You'll never escape your way to an extraordinary life. The only way you get that is by deciding what that means to you. What is that extraordinary life? What is that fulfillment? What is it you want? And that's got to be a process that is consistent. Not something you do once in a while when you got a birthday with a zero on the end. Not something that you do, you know, at New Year's where you sit down and go, all right, you know, I better look at my life, see how I'm doing, all right, let's make some resolutions that I know I'm going to break within the week, and then I'll check in on them maybe a year from now, next New Year's, and see how I'm doing. That's called recipe for failure. Do you think most people in life are fulfilled or are most people in life stressed? Now, let me tell you, stress is a code word for fear. 
See, when somebody says they're stressed, that's because they don't want to say I'm fearful. You know, no, no, I'm just stressed. I have all these things to do. Well, why are you stressed about it? Well, if I don't get them done, if you don't get them done, what? Well, then everybody will be upset. Well, what if they are a little upset? Well, uh, you know, well, then I'll have failed. Well, if you fail, what does that mean? Well, you keep on digging. If they fail, they feel like if they fail, then they're worthless. If they're worthless, they won't be loved. You know, stress comes from making things more important than they really are. And most people in life are spending all their time majoring in minor things. They're putting all their focus, all their energy, all their attention on responding to the reactions of the moment rather than stopping in that timeless place of who you are and saying, gosh, what is it that I really want today? What do I want to create? Because i got to tell you something. Everything in the outside world, everything around you that you like or dislike, that's stressing you or that you're thrilled about, was first created on the inside. Everything that you're experiencing in your life, your relationship, the way your kids are, your job, your opportunities, it all started with decisions you made in your head, decisions about what to focus on, decisions about what things were meaning, whether you should be upset about it, whether you should learn from it, whether this is a challenge, an opportunity, or a crisis, and the decision about what you're going to do. These decisions are shaping your life. you got to understand, getting the edge simply means this. 80% of success in anything in life is psychology. The ability to manage your mindset, your ability to find the opportunity in any situation. This isn't stupid positive thinking where you just sit around and, you know, go to your garden and say, there's no weeds, there's no weeds, there's no weeds, there's no weeds. I don't believe in that kind of positive thinking. It's garbage. There's weeds there and you got to pull them out. But you got to have enough intelligence, enough psychology to say, I'm not going to see it worse than it is. Because, you know, people say, I'm skeptical, I'm pessimistic. Oh, garbage, you're fearful. If you say you're skeptical or you're pessimistic, what you're really saying is, I'm afraid of being disappointed. I don't want to get my hopes up. I don't want to look naive. So I don't want to be hurt again. But I got news for you. If you're going to have an extraordinary quality of life, if you're going to get the edge in life or the passion and the juice and the joy and the fulfillment and the happiness and the love and the family is, where the Quan is, like Jerry Maguire talked about, right? Well, you got it all. You got the love, the respect, the connection, the contribution, the money, the fun, the fame, the whatever. Whatever your definition of, of the ultimate level of life, that edge comes when you master your mind and your emotions. But you know what? 20% of your success is mechanics, and they do play a role. And sometimes our mechanics are getting in the way of our psychology. Sometimes we've structured our life where there's no time to think or be. So you say, okay, if you ran through the rave, what am I supposed to do? All right, you start to kind of say, I should take some time for myself. Where am I going to find that? I got to get up. I got to take the kids to school. I got to make it to work. I get it all done. I come back home. I got to pick them up. We got to take them to dance lessons, to soccer. Well, you know, then I got to work on my homework. Then I got to answer all my emails. When am I going to do this stuff? Stop. We all get what we have to have. That's it. The most basic principle getting the edge is for you to understand and for me to remember, for all of us to remember, we all get our musts, we don't get our shoulds. You know, everybody's got a list of shoulds. I should take time to work out. You know, I should take time for myself. I should actually go on a diet. I should make more calls. I should just allow myself to listen to some music and meditate a little bit. I should, I should, I should, I should. I should do my taxes. But most people doing this stuff, they just what I call should all over themselves. You don't want to should all over yourself. Here's what's true. What you must do, what you believe is a must, happens. Right now, you're earning what you must earn and not a dime more. Not what you want to. Don't get me wrong. And listen, I know I sound like I'm ranting. That's because I'm a nut. But by being a nut, I've achieved a lot. I've achieved a lot of things in my dreams and goals that have happened because what I am is I'm unreasonable in my expectations. So if I sound unreasonable, it's not to be disrespectful and it's not just a rant. It's because I know I've spent the last 30 years of my life now with more than 3 million people from every walk of life, from presidents of countries to presidents of companies to parents to children, best sports people in the world. I've had the chance to find the difference in people, and the difference is in their unreasonable psychology. That unreasonableness has gotten them to say, this is a must, and I will settle for nothing less. And those individuals, whether it's a woman like Rosa Parks on a bus who says, no, I will not move to the back of the bus. That was completely unreasonable. She had no way to back it up, and she changed the world. Or a little lady, tiny woman with no background, no education, no money, who decides she's going to change the world, Mother Teresa. A person who, by the power of her will, her psychology, her unreasonableness, by making it a must to help people that no one would help, by making that her must, she changed the world. When she died, every major leader in the world flew. 100,000 people lined the streets to watch a woman who supposedly had no resources. Unreasonable men and women shape the world. If you want to get the edge, you've got to get unreasonable. The way you get unreasonable is you turn your shoulds into musts. 
And I'm here to tell you, you're earning what you must earn. You have the time you must have. You know, if you say to me, oh, you know, I really want a relationship, but I'm not in one, then your relationship's a should and not a must. What's really a must is you don't want to be hurt. It's a must not to be hurt. And if it's a must not to be hurt, you're not going to be in a relationship. Because if you're going to be in a relationship, there's going to be hurts. That's part of the nature of relationship. But there's going to be more joy than you could ever imagine, too. Right? The advantage. You want to get the edge? Get over your fear. And tell yourself the truth. we got to take a specific time each day where you break away from the hypnosis of the culture that tells you to settle for less than you can be, that tells you not to get your hopes up, that tells you you should protect yourself, that tells you that basically your life cannot be what you dreamed about as a child. And I'm here to tell you that as long as you buy into the culture, you'll be like the majority of the population who have no advantage and have to settle for a life that really is what I call no man's land, a life where they're not really happy, but they're not unhappy enough to do anything about it, a life where there is no passion and no real drive, just that sinking feeling that your life does not have a real meaning or a real purpose, but you got to continue. That's a place no one wants to live, and that's unfortunately where the majority of people live. Do you agree with me on this or disagree? If you disagree, I'm respectful of that. But if you want more, and if you believe that that's possible, and you're the kind of person that won't settle, then this is the first session in you reclaiming your power. It's the first session in you putting your foot down and saying, I will not be denied. It's the first session you saying my body, my mind, my emotions, my relationships, my finances, my career, they're not going to be perfect, but they're going to be extraordinary. And it won't be overnight, but what will change overnight is my expectations of myself. Not my expectations will suddenly be perfect without any work. This is not a little cajoling session to say, uh, I'm going to pump myself up. I'm going to be Stuart Smalley and say, I'm good enough, I'm strong enough, I'm kind enough, and by golly, people like me. No, some people don't like you. Some people are going to fight to try and keep you from achieving. Some people are going to tell you you're wasting your time. And some people are going to try and trip you up for people that you love. And it's not because they don't love you or they're trying to hurt you. It's they don't want to be left behind. Or they don't want you know your success to make them feel inferior, like you're achieving. Or, or even if you're not succeeding, even if you're striving. And they're not. There's contrast in that. That's part of life. You don't have to think anything else is to be dumb, and you're not dumb, or you would have turned this tape off a long time ago. So give this thing to somebody I don't like. This guy's crazy. You know, I am a little crazy, but you got to be a little crazy. you got to be a little different. you got to be a little weird in your expectations the rest of society, because if you agree with everybody else, you know you're in trouble. I mean, somebody told me a long time ago, find out where the masses are going. Go the opposite direction. Your chances are better. You know, you don't want to be part of the hypnosis of a culture that settles. Not if you want the advantage in life. Not if you want the edge. And again, the edge is living life on your terms. It doesn't mean the edge over something or someone else. It means living at the level of life where life is fully worth living, where that meaning is there. So how do we do this? What do we need to do today to start this process? Well, the first thing we've got to do is understand what creates that extraordinary life. And we've already identified it. An extraordinary life does not come from more money. Because lots of people have lots of money, and they're still miserable. They're unhappy. They're unhealthy. Their relationships are weak. And there are people who have no money whatsoever who are totally happy and fulfilled. You know, it's not coming from having a great relationship. That doesn't give you extraordinary quality of life. How many people you know have an incredible person who loves them totally, but they don't feel loved? Or they feel loved by them, but they still feel like their life is meaningless or worthless because they haven't achieved enough. They haven't done enough. Their body's not strong enough. Their kids haven't accomplished enough. See, it's not going to come from money. It's not going to come from a relationship. It's not going to come from your job. It's not going to come from getting a raise. It's not going to come from anything but you finally stopping and understanding that the quality of your life is in direct proportion to the quality of the emotions you're in on a daily basis. If you live in frustration, if you live in resentment, if you live in anger, if you live in rejection, if you live in self-pity, if you live in those emotional states, the quality of your life, no matter what happens, no matter how much money you get, no matter how many people think they love you, no matter how much you achieve, will be worthless. If you live in a space of gratitude, if you cultivate the emotion of passion, if you cultivate the emotion of excitement, of love, of compassion, of drive, of hunger, of ambition, of appreciation, of grace, of humility... In those states, it won't matter what happens in your job. It won't matter what challenges come, because they're going to come. I mean, it's only a matter of time. You'll have another one soon. We all got problems. Problems are a sign of life. And the way we deal with them determines the quality of our life. And the way we deal with them is where do you spend your time emotionally? Where are you? That 
idea of an extraordinary life only comes from an extraordinary psychology, which is a mindset that allows you to find an empowering meaning in whatever life gives you. I mean, I meet people all the time that are so upset over the littlest things, and you meet somebody who's terminally ill, and you don't even know it. You don't even know. You find out later on from somebody else. They're so happy. They're so exciting. You talk to them and say, how do you do this? And they say, listen, to me, it's not how long I live. It's how I live. I'm here to live fully while I'm here, while I'm alive. I'm going to get upset about little stuff like that. I have a friend that was shot down in Vietnam, was locked up for seven years. His name is Captain Jerry Coffey. And Captain Coffey and I have been friends for several decades now. But I'll tell you, the greatest thing he did that allowed him to make this one of the best experiences of his life, which is ridiculous as that sounds, he really experiences and believes, is because he developed a set of rituals while he was in that prison that allowed him to take control of his body, his mind, his emotions, and to this day, they live inside him. One of the most valuable things of this session, the reason we call it this hour of power, and the shortcut to it, by the way, is called 30 minutes to thrive, or at least 15 minutes to be fulfilled, everybody's got 15 minutes, is a set of rituals of what you're going to do with your body, your vision or focus, your emotion, your language, that will gear you up to be able to handle anything. Where literally, whatever happens, you'll be able to say the same thing about that aspect of your life as Jerry Coffey said about those seven years. See, in any moment in time, you can be upset about anything. Because what's wrong is always available. I mean, you know, if there's nothing wrong with you, if you got kids, there's something wrong there. I promise you. Just look. Or there's something wrong with your spouse. There's something wrong with your boss. Or there's something wrong with the world. There's something wrong in Africa. There's something wrong somewhere. What's wrong is always available, and so is what's right. If you don't consciously decide what you're going to focus on every day and make it a priority, then weeds grow automatically. You don't have to plant weeds. They're automatic. You don't have to worry about gravity. Something's going to pull you down unless you use your will to stand up and move. You go, well, it's just natural to be down all the time. Well, then it's natural to lie on the ground, right? But how we have an extraordinary life is we resist the natural forces. I remember years ago when I met Norman Vincent Peale. He was amazing. He was 92 years old. And he was doing a seminar. And I was 32 at the time. And I thought, gosh, only 60 more years of this. <laughs> you know? And so I said to him, I said, Norman, what are you doing still going out here doing seminars at 92 years old? And he was so cute. He turned to me and he said, Tony, there's still a few negative people out there. <laughs> I started laughing. I said, you're the best. And I said, tell me, what's the most important thing you want people to understand when you're talking? He said that problems are a sign of life. He's the person I got that from. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, everybody's talking about how they don't want any problems. He said, but the only people that have problems are people that live in cemeteries. And I said, I heard that somewhere. He said, well, yeah, I said that in 1936. <laughs> he said, my God, he's been around a while. But the reason I tell the story about him is the idea of resistance. He said to me, you know, when he first met Gene Tunney, who was the heavyweight boxing champion of the world back then, he said, I went up to Gene and I said, Gene, how do you get muscles like that? And Gene looked at me and said, do you really want to know or are you just asking? And Norman said, actually, I was just asking. <laughs> but he said, I didn't say that to him. I said, yeah, I want to know. And he said, Gene looked at me. He got really intense. He put this grimace on his face. He made his bicep really huge and showed me the size. And he said, you know how I get this? Every day I push against enormous amounts of resistance. And my pushing against that resistance sculpts these muscles. They expand by demand. I thought, wow, expand by demand. That's pretty cool. And Norman looked at me and he said, you know, I thought about that for a long time. And he said, you know what I realized? He said, I realized that God gives us problems because problems are the resistance that we have to push against to sculpt our character, to sculpt our souls. And he said, if we didn't have any problems, we don't have a life. And I thought, you know, he's right. The only thing I want is a better quality of problem. <laughs> you know, in the beginning, I had the problems like, oh, how do I eat? You know, how do I take care of myself? Then in my business, how do I get someone to show up? Then it was like, oh, my God, we can't get a big enough stadium. These are quality problems. I have to remind my team of that. But the reason I tell you that is whether it's a problem or whether it's an opportunity, it comes down to focus. If you're in a lousy state, everything's a problem. When you're feeling strong, when you're in that place, when you feel alive, then all of a sudden what used to be a problem is like, ah, oh, we can handle it. But if you don't do something every day to get yourself in that state first and you first get hit with stuff, I promise you, you're not going to deal with it the same way. So let's get right to the point here. If you're going to have an extraordinary life, that life where you are juiced, then all that means is you're going to have a life where the primary emotions of your life are the ones you want. See, it doesn't mean that life works out every way you want. Sometimes it rains on your parade. Sometimes the events of your life you can't control, but you can control what it means to you. And when you control what it means to you, you have the ultimate power of your life. You have the edge. 
the ultimate advantage. See, I'll give you an example. Did you see that movie that won the Academy Award, Life is Beautiful? It's a story of a man who has an extraordinary life. Not because he has more money than anybody else, not because he's in a situation where everything is easy, but because he's alive. He has this joy about him. And by the way, if you've actually ever met Roberto Benigni, the man who plays this character, you know that he lives this way day to day. You know, he was authoring this thing from himself. He's such a joyous guy. And when he won the Academy Award, you never saw so much emotion. He was like a little boy. And everybody loved it because nobody else has the guts to be that way. Or they've forgotten what it feels like to just feel, to be alive. What makes him extraordinary? An extraordinary psychology. An extraordinary mindset. An extraordinary way of looking at the world. And in the movie, the man has that, doesn't he? And who does it affect? Everyone. Everyone within the realm of his influence. His wife feels like the most cherished person on earth, and so so does he. Because when you give that kind of love and that kind of joy, people give it back. It's infectious. His son seems so happy, and they're in the middle of the Nazis taking over their country, and if you know the story, I won't run it, you know that they get picked up. And there's such a connection amongst the family that the wife is not being sent away, and she gets on the train with them. And they're in the middle of this camp. This man, with his extraordinary psychology, figures a way of looking at the situation for his son, presenting it so that his son sees it as a game. Isn't life a game anyway? Instead of this horrible situation and because he has that perspective in the end his family survives see if you want your family to survive if you want them to succeed if you want them to have joy if you want your kids to have a lasting love if you want to be able to give gifts in your life and not just take care of yourself then you gotta have an extraordinary psychology within yourself it's not where you live physically it's where you live internally. There are two worlds, the inside world and the outside world. We can't totally control the outside one, but we have absolute control on the inside one. But you know what? Most of us are too busy to take any time to check out and see how it's going on in here. Or we just accept it as this is the status quo. This is who I am. This is my life. Or, or I'll get to it later. Manana. I got to handle this first. Something else that's not so important. I want to invite you, my friend to take the time to say, I'm going to have every day an hour of power. Every day I'm going to have at least 30 minutes to thrive or 15 minutes to be fulfilled, for God's sakes, where I'm going to take those 15 minutes and I'm going to focus on everything I'm grateful for. I mean, if, if we're going to have a life, we got to have time. And the time has to have some specific things we do, and one of those is gratitude. If you want to know what's the quality of your life, how much time do you spend in gratitude? How much time are you grateful and appreciative to the point that emotion wells up in you? I'm feeling it now. I'm so grateful to God. I'm so grateful to have the privilege to serve you right now. So if you can get to that state, everything changes. I'll give you an example. If you think about being fearful, when you're fearful, you're not grateful. And everybody's got fears. Fear they're not enough. Fear that it won't work out. Fear they won't be loved. Everybody's got that at some level unconsciously. We're human. So you can put the fear aside when you're grateful. I don't just mean intellectually. Yeah, I'm grateful for this. I'm grateful for that. I mean stopping, thinking, seeing, and feeling. So I'm going to walk you through a system that includes gratitude. Every day of our life, we got to have a vision. Every day of our life, we got to have something that excites us. When people tell me, oh, I'm bored, I'm tired, you know, everything, oh, that thing is boring. No, you're boring because you don't have something that excites you in your life. You haven't come up with a vision. You haven't come something to move towards. We all need something that's going to make us use more of who we are, our courage, our passion, our joy, face our fears, build our emotional muscles. But you don't build emotional muscles when you do the same thing day after day after day. What you get is a life that's unfulfilling. So we've got to have a vision. So every day I'm going to take you through a simple process that will get you to expand your vision so you have a compelling future. That thing that makes you want to get up early. There's a reason. you got to have a reason. And, you know, I have friends that have sold their companies. One guy sold his company and made almost a billion dollars in cash, about $800 million plus. And, you know, he was so excited for about two months, maybe three. But you know what? After that, you know, there's only so much time you want to sit on the beach by yourself because everybody else is working, you know, and doing something and being productive. There's only so many cocktails you can take. You know, there's only so many, you know, movies you can watch. There's only, I mean, there's a limit to it. What he needed was a new vision. 
Anytime you achieve a goal, as you get close to it, you better set up the next one real quick, because otherwise it's kind of like postpartum. You were looking forward to that, baby, and now you got them. <laughs> you know? And sometimes in the middle of the night, you're going, what did I do here? Have you ever had that experience? I got four kids. I can relate. I hope you can. But you know what? You also have the experience on the other side of it. It's so wonderful. It's kind of like you got to have a vision for what your life's about now. Without a vision, people perish. And you got to have a daily vision that'll excite you. Otherwise, life becomes mundane. And there's nothing worse than an okay life. I told you, you're not going to have that when we're done here. I promise you, if you get this little habit, you won't have to settle for a mundane life. What people are going to go is, what happened to you? Because there's an excitement in creation. There's not a lot of excitement in maintenance. I mean, you have to maintain your body. you got to maintain things. But creating things, that's what God created us for. Gave us the gift to make choices that could create new things, businesses, ideas, families, friends, you know, a garden. And it's available to every one of us. But if you don't get a vision each day, then the day is not going to have much juice, is it? So every day there's got to be a little time for vision, right? Time for gratitude, time for vision. Every day you got to move. I'll tell you why most people are unhappy. They don't move. Look at our lives today. I mean, most people live in a box, don't they? And then what do they do? They get up in the morning, have a box cereal breakfast, right? And then they get in their box and they drive. And sure enough, they drive to their box office. They go up a box elevator. They type on a box. They talk on a box. They have a box lunch. They drive their box home. They turn in a box to be entertained. And maybe, maybe they just really go for the variety and have a cylinder to try and change their state. Listen, life has got to be about movement. When you move, you're alive. Emotion comes from motion. The more you move, the more you feel. Motion in your voice. For me to have this voice change, I'm changing the way I move. You saw me right now, you think I'm a maniac because I'm moving different ways, but that's how you feel. And by the way, the less you move, the less you feel, the less alive you are. If you're totally rigid, totally inflexible, no movement, this is known as death. Right? So if you have emotionally, you're stuck, move. So every day you got to move. Now that can be a simple, gentle form of exercise, but it's something that's got to happen. And by the way, if you want a great relationship with anybody, what do you got to have? some time with them, don't you? How about you? How about you? And not only do you have to have time with them, but maybe have a conversation with them. And most of us got conversations in our head, but we're not directing them. So we're going to show you each day how to have a conversation that you direct, a way of directing your mind, of shaping your mind, of conditioning your mind. It's kind of like going to the gym and just getting in the best shape of your life, but it's the best mental, emotional, spiritual, physical shape. And you don't need me to do it. I don't have to follow you around the rest of your life. This is going to be something you're going to do for yourself. And remember, if you don't do this every day, it's okay. I don't do it every day either. But I'll tell you what I did. I did it for years. I did it for months in a row. The way I shifted myself is I realized I can't do this once in a while. I got to drive it, drive it, drive it in my body. And I did. The physical change, the focus, the language, until I literally felt it, breathed it, experienced it. I mean, I literally drilled and programmed my mind that I would follow through where I would expect the best, where I would take action without hesitancy. If you're not yet getting the result, Come back to this process. If you miss a day, just do it the next day. But I will tell you this. If you do this for the next 30 days, 21 minimum, couple weeks, absolute minimum, I'm talking at least 15, 20, 30 minutes, you're going to get momentum. You're going to get addicted to this. You're not going to be doing like it's a chore. You're going to look forward to this time with yourself. You're going to come out so vital and strong for your day or it's the end of the day to get ready for the next one. You're going to love it. And I will tell you, I've talked to people who've done this for years and they stop for a while. And then something else showed up in their life, and they know exactly where to go to get back on target. They come back to this hour of power. And you don't have to do the full hour. Just do 15 minutes to be fulfilled. Do seven, eight, or nine minutes where you move your body. You get focused on what you're grateful about. You focus on what you really want. You do some incantations, and you'll be rocking and rolling. And if you do that, you'll get momentum. Pretty soon you go, oh, let me do at least 15 minutes. Oh, man, this is feeling good. Let me go for a half hour. Don't you deserve at least 30 minutes out of your day? Out of 24 hours? An hour of 24 hours to have the power and the juice and the excitement and the strength be activated in you? Listen, all this stuff's in you. But if we don't focus, if we don't activate it, we're not going to have the power and fulfillment we deserve. But if you do, I'm telling you, life, whatever you've dreamed about, about creating or shaping or experiencing, it'll be a cartoon compared to the experience you'll actually have of your life or what you'll really create. I know this not only from my own experience, but from millions of other people who do it. This has got to become your baby, your time. Take it, use it, live it. By the way, this is a process you're going to do for yourself. I'll be here for you on this audio program, this ultimate edge, but you don't need me. 
This becomes a ritual you can do on your own. You ever want to kick in the butt or you want some guidance? Come back here and I'll be here for you. But this is something you can do for the rest of your life. It's not creating any dependency. This is your life. This is your process. And it'll be your reward. So how does it work? Well, let's do this first. It's time for you to make some discoveries. So I'm going to ask you just take a moment. And if you have our journal there, you can do it in a journal. You can do it on a piece of paper. You don't make it rules driven. Just do it. Don't just do it in your head. I want you to write down all the emotions you experience in an average week. And on one side, write all the good ones. The other side, all the bad ones. Now, when I say bad ones, there really are no bad emotions, but the ones that are painful and you don't like. So all I want you to do is write them down. And when you write them down, try not to edit them. Don't try and say, well, just do it this way. If you experience this emotion on a consistent basis, doesn't mean every day, but at least once a week, write it down. The ones you consistently feel, not the one once in a while you feel this feeling, because what this is going to tell us is where you're really living right now. This doesn't tell me your income. I don't care, but I care about what you're passionate about. I care about what hurts you. I care about what you love. I care about what moves you, and you do too. And you don't even have to tell me the what's. Let's just figure out the feelings first. So please, take a moment right now, because now we're going to begin to stop talking, and we're going to start the process of doing. First step here is let's figure out where you are. Write down now, on one side, all the emotions you consistently feel in a week that are positive. On the other side, all negative. So stop the tape right now, or if it's a CD, just pause it, and get yourself to this right now. Go ahead. Are you still listening? I'm not going to continue until you do this. Come on here. You got to get the right. Don't just listen. Okay, if you're in your car and you say you can't do it, then turn off the CD or tape, stop it, pause it, and do it in your head at least. Or pull the car over. You're worth figuring out where you are. Cars are going to go by. You're going to drive the rest of your life. You're still going to get there. It'll take three minutes. Come on, be one of the few to do. Pull over. That's it. Pull over right now. Sit down and write this out just for a second. I promise you it'll be worth it. Go ahead and do it. Do it right now. So now you have some emotions that you really want. How do you create them? And you have some emotions you don't want. How do you get rid of them? Well, what if I told you you literally could change how you feel in an instant? Well, you know this is true from your past experience at times, right? There are times where you're totally upset and then something got your attention and now you're laughing. You know, people can be literally at a funeral and they're in a terrible place and all of a sudden something cracks them up. I mean, it's pretty rare, but it has happened. People can be in a place where they're in the worst situation and somehow they find all their determination. How to do that specifically is what I want to show you real quickly now. And I'm going to give you a quick overview of it, but I'll give it to you in three parts. Three things you need to feel anything. These are the reasons why you feel anything. In other words, if you feel sad or upset or frustrated or depressed, there's only three reasons. And if you change any one of these three, you're going to change how you feel. And if you change all three, you'll change how you feel completely. If you're feeling happy, if you're feeling excited, if you're feeling euphoric, if you're on a roll and you want to know why you feel that way, yeah, maybe great things are happening in your life, but there's a reason why you feel that way in this moment. Sometimes you have great things happen in your life and you still don't feel great. So how do you do that? There's three reasons. Three things have to be in place for you to feel great. I call these three reasons the triad because there are three patterns that if you do these three patterns in your body in a certain way, you'll get a certain result and it's like a recipe. You do one recipe, you get one result. You do another one, you get a different result. You get one kind of cake or another. So let's give you an example. I have an initial seminar, an immersion, where in one weekend people get massive momentum to change their life. It's called Unleash the Power Within. It's a chance in a weekend to really step up and say, I'm going to transform it. I don't care if it's my body, my emotions, a fear, my job. It's time to do it. And we put people in an environment for three days of total immersion. That is a blast. And people come out transformed. That process, though, very often, well, one of the first things I'll do is I'll ask people, what do you really want? Just I'll take people in the audience. We've got 1,500, 2,000 people in that type of program usually, and they'll say, oh, well, I want to make you know a million dollars. I want to make a billion dollars. I want to help my kids get through school. I want to have more confidence. I want to lose 57 pounds. They say, okay, great. Why do you want these things? If you lost the 57 pounds, if you made the billion dollars, what are you going to get? And sooner or later, they'd say, well, you know, if I change the world... It'll make a difference. And I'll say, yeah, but what will that give you? And eventually say, well, it'll make me feel good, like my life had meaning. Or they'll say, you know, if I lost 47 pounds, I'd feel more sexy or I'd feel more energetic. Or they'd say, if I made this money, I'd feel freedom or power or secure. Whatever it is you want, you only want it because you think it's going to give you a feeling. And the truth of the matter is you can have that feeling right now if you just change these three patterns I'm going to tell you about. So the first pattern that determines how you feel is not the event, but what you do with your body in this moment. Right now, you're feeling, whatever you're feeling right now as you're listening to me, is related first to how you're using your body. 
If you're slumped over, if you've not been using it, if you're tired, you probably feel different than if you're listening to me walking right now as an example. Now, I'll give you a more specific example. If I were to tell you that there was a depressed person behind curtain number one over here, and for a $100,000 donation to your favorite charity, if you could describe them physically without seeing them, I bet you could do it, couldn't you? What's their posture like? You know, say it, or think it at least. You can say it. No one's going to hear you. You're probably in the car. You're walking. People talk on phones all the time. They don't know what's going on. Speak to me. Seriously, what, what's their body like? First, their posture is probably what? Slumped. Where are their eyes? Down. Where's their head? Down. What's their breathing like? Full or shallow? Of course it's shallow. Their facial expression, up and tight or slack? You know it's slack. Now, how come you know all these things without me telling you? Because you've practiced this stuff before, haven't you? We all have if we've ever experienced this. Now, if you do this with your body, I don't care who we are. If you do these things to your body, you're going to feel lousy. You're going to feel depressed. Now, if you change the way you use your body, if you put your shoulders back, if you breathe, if you use your voice in a different way, if you move or gesture at a different tempo, it's hard to feel depressed in that way. In fact, there was a research study that was done early in my career that was done at UC Berkeley. And they did something that sounded insane. Traditionally, if somebody's depressed, if they go to a traditional psychiatric approach, today we live with a philosophy that depression is merely a Prozac deficiency. Know that we live in this world today that if things aren't working out, let's not resolve what's going on inside you. Let's just drug you. It's called better living through chemistry. Yeah, just drug you and keep on going. We do the same thing with kids today. We've got this attention deficit disorder. They've now upgraded it to ADHD, attention deficit hyperactive disorder. This couldn't be the fact that kids are overstimulated, don't get enough focus or attention, and don't know how to use their energy in a world where things are going so slow when they're learning in school compared to how they are on the Internet or not MTV or anything else. It must be that we should drug them into submission so they get as slow as us and we're comfortable. It's an interesting way that we look at life today. The truth of the matter is these kids are using their bodies in ways that aren't acceptable, but they're not being directed. We go for the quick hit. We want the instant solution, even if it isn't the long-term solution that makes us more healthy. You can get a solution, but it may not be sustainable in a healthful way. The bottom line is, in that approach, we usually drug people. So at UC Berkeley, they tried something different. No drugs. Did something you're going to think sounds so stupid. Here's all they did. They came up with a simple approach. They took people that were clinically depressed. This means you achieved high levels of depression. You've got certification now. You are clinically depressed. You are an achiever at the depression level. This means you practice this pattern on a regular basis. And they took them. And by the way, I know I'm sounding obnoxious right now. I'm not trying to make depression sound like these people are terrible because I felt it in my life a long time ago too, but I don't go there anymore because I know exactly what creates it. And I want to break the pattern of us thinking we're not in control. So please understand where I'm really coming from. But the point is, here's what they did. They had people come for four weeks, stand in front of this mirror that has three parts to it, and do one silly thing. Grin from ear to ear. And they had to make them smile for no good reason for 20 minutes. Now, when they're doing this, they had a grin so big that they created crow's feet on the side of the eyes. You know that little set of lines you're smiling so big? Now, interesting, they keep their shoulders back while they're doing this and breathe fully. You go, dumb idea. But what happened? Not a single person was able to remain depressed, including a woman who claimed that she was depressed even while she slept, which is one heck of an accomplishment. And you know what's interesting? At the end of these 20 days, many of them had no need for medication anymore, and that's all they changed. Only one part of what we call their triad. Just the physical part. That's how powerful it is. See, if you rise up, if you move up, if you use your body in a totally different way, you're going to feel different. Emotion is created by motion. See, we have 80 muscles in our face. How many of them are you using? Consciously. Are you doing anything different with your body so you can feel different? Or do you do the same things so you feel the same things? You look at your list you have written down there. That list represents a few patterns that you do in your body on a regular basis and you don't even think about it. And whenever you do it, you're going to feel it. Some make you feel good when you do that. Some make you feel bad. By the way, when you think about a movement, to breathe, you got to move. To sing, you got to move. To speak. If I start talking like this, I'm moving organs in my body in a different way than if I start speaking more like this. And I said, Hi, I'm Tony Robbins, and I'm going to share with you now how to have an extraordinary life during the next 7,000 hours of this program. <laughs> you got... Turn this guy off quick! There's got to be some combination of energy there, and that energy comes because I'm not sitting in a chair here. I don't have a script in front of me. I'm looking at this microphone. I'm visualizing your face, and I'm trying to think what I can give you that I know will make a difference based on 25 years of experience. And I'm telling you, the number one thing is change the way you move. 
Change the way you use your body, and you'll change the way you feel now, instantly. I don't care how bad you felt if you change it. Now, if you just change it for a second, and you move your hands up for a moment, you make a little minor change, you'll get a minor change in feeling. But if you make a radical change, if you go, yes, I'm doing this now, I'm sick of this, I promise you, you're going to feel different if you go, oh, I don't know what to do. I know this sounds so stupid, but it works. And you know what? The best study of life is what works, even if it's simple. It's nice to have things simple. Why do we have to make it so hard to feel good? Here's the second part of the triad. The second part is the pattern of focus and belief, and they relate to one another. See, whatever you focus on, you're going to feel whether it's true or not. Have you ever had an experience where somebody did something or you thought somebody did something? Even better example. You heard, you thought, and you thought they did it to take advantage of you. And as you focused on that, you got angry or sad or hurt. And then later on, you found out you were dead wrong, that either they never did it, it wasn't true, or that wasn't their intent, and you felt bad about it, or you felt embarrassed. How can that be? Because whatever we focus on, we feel, whether it's true or not. Focus equals feeling, just like the way you move affects your feeling. See, right now, if I said to you, what are you juiced about in your life? What could you be excited about? If you really wanted to be excited in your life right now, what could you be excited about? Or what are you proud of? Or what could you be proud of if you wanted to be proud? Or who in your life do you really love? Who loves you? Think about it for a moment. Who do you really love? Who loves you? By the way, how does that feel when you focus on or you think about someone you love? See, whatever you focus on, you're going to feel. Focus equals reality to the individual, even though it's not reality in actuality. I'll say that again. Focus equals reality to the individual, even though it's not reality in actuality. That's a complicated way of saying whatever you focus on, you're going to feel, whether it's true or not, because your brain doesn't know the difference between something you vividly imagine, that's called focus on, or something you actually experience. It's very powerful. If you use this to your advantage, it means something very simple. How fast can you change how you feel? As fast as you change your focus. As fast as you change the way you move. See, right now, if you're focused on something that's really upsetting or something you're worried about or something you're fearful about, you're going to feel those feelings. If you focus on something you're really grateful for, you're going to feel a totally different set of feelings. See, you are in control, and you can change your feelings in an instant. The problem is we don't believe we can change that fast. And the second problem is we have patterns of doing this, don't we? We tend to, like on a regular basis, focus on what overwhelms us or focus on what we're upset with in our spouse or focus on why we failed in the past. And you know, if you keep focusing on things where you didn't succeed, guess what? You're going to feel like a failure. And when you feel like a failure, you're not going to take action to make things better. You can't build on the past that doesn't work. But you can also focus on what you want and what you want to create. You can focus on the solution. Hey, when you got a problem, everybody's got problems. But 95% of your time has got to be spent on the solution. 5% of the problem. Most of us spend all the time describing the problem more and more and more and more detail, and we wonder why we feel overwhelmed. Focus is the secret key to changing, and you can do it in an instant. One way to change your focus is to change the third thing, your language patterns. See, all day long, we're thinking. What's thinking? All day long, you're asking and answering questions with yourself. Should I do this? What does this mean? Why is this? Where is this going on? That's what initiates thinking is a question. You know what the problem is? We have patterns of questions we ask that don't serve us. Some of us ask questions like, how come this always happens to me? Well, it doesn't always happen to you. But if you ask a lousy question like that on a regular basis, your brain goes, because you're an idiot. You know, how come I can never lose weight? Well, you can lose weight, but ask a lousy question, ask and you shall what? You receive. How come I can never lose weight? Your brain says, because you're a pig. You know, come up with a better question for God's sake. See, questions direct us. Questions are a form of language. And if you want to change your life, one of the things I have people discover is what questions you're asking. And also, what phrases do you say a lot? Because phrases hypnotize us. We have certain words by themselves that will change the way you feel. If somebody says to you, hey, listen, I think you're mistaken about that. You might have one feeling. They go, you're wrong. You feel something very different just by the language. If somebody says, you're lying, you have a whole different feeling, don't you? One word can change the way you feel when someone else speaks it to you. The words you select powerfully affect you. And I don't mean just being positive and doing the Stuart Smalley thing where you got positive self-talk, right? And you say, I'm good enough, I'm strong enough, and by golly, people like me. No! I mean noticing the habit of the words and the emotions they create. And then third part of language is the phrases that you say with such emotional intensity that you start to believe them. 
We call those incantations. An incantation is like if you remember studying mythology, you know, a sorcerer would tell a prince over and over again a phrase over and over again with such intensity that he'd be hypnotized and he'd think that he was a frog. And so, of course, he was a frog. That's what he experienced. We experience whatever we focus on. We feel whatever we picture. We feel whatever we say to ourselves. We feel whatever we do with our bodies. Those are the three patterns. If you change those three patterns, any one of the three, you're going to change how you feel. If you change all three, you're going to radically change how you feel. If you change the pattern of how you use your body, if you change the pattern of what you focus on daily, which, by the way, I'm going to show you a technique for doing today that could change your life. Very simple. If you change the pattern of what you say to yourself with the emotional intensity you say it, you're going to change the pattern of how you feel. Now that means you could pick any feeling you want and say, if I want to feel that way, what do I do with my body when I'm in that state? How do I move? How do I speak? What do I do? Let me try it. What, when I'm feeling that good, what do I focus on? What do I really focus on? And by the way, what does it mean to me when I focus on it? Because you can focus on something and one person looks at it and says, because that happened, that's why I can never be close to another man or woman in my life. That's why I can never trust again. And somebody else had the same experience. And they go, you know, because that happened, you know what? I've learned so much about myself. And because that happened, I appreciate the person I'm with now so much. You can't have a foreground without a background, right? That's the secret to life. We have absolute choice. We have absolute control about how we feel. And whatever feelings we put in our lives on a regular basis will determine the quality of our lives. So you can have frustration, anger, upset, overwhelm, insecurity. You know, you can be fearful. You can live in a state of guilt, worry, whatever, or you can live in a place called passion, joy, thankfulness, gratefulness, connection, love, wonder. And if you create those emotions on a regular basis, are you going to have a different life? You bet you are. Okay, so how do we take these three understandings and make it so we don't have to think about it, but we actually, on a regular basis, condition ourselves to have the great emotions we want and get rid of the emotions you don't want? Well, first step is awareness. See, next time you start to feel like, oh, so frustrated, I'm so angry about this, notice what you're doing with your cheeks. What are you doing with your mouth? What happened to your breathing just now to do that? What's happening to your eyebrows? Are you tightening your fingers in your hands? Because we all have very specific things we do to get into our version of anger or frustration or tired or overwhelmed. Does that make sense? Just notice. What's happening to your body? Say, okay, I'm not breathing. That's a clue. Let me start with a little change there. My mouth is so tight, I can't even talk. That might be a clue why you're a little uptight. So loosen your jaw. Second thing, okay, what am I focusing on? I'm focusing on how, you know, this, this isn't working. Now, to help you understand the belief part, ask yourself, in order to feel this way, what would I have to believe? In order to be frustrated, what would I have to believe? I have to believe that it, it should be better than it is, and, and it's not, and, and it's not working. Well, maybe it isn't working, but is that going to help you to focus on it isn't working? Let's focus on what we can do. Or if you say, you know, I, I feel... I feel like it's hopeless because in order to feel hopeless, I have to believe that there's nothing I can do. Is that really true? Is there's nothing you can do? Or are you just caught up in a state? Are you just caught up in a pattern? See, if you ask yourself, what do I have to believe to feel this way? It'll help you to break that part of the triad because you'll start to say, yeah, that isn't really even true. All right, so that'll help you there. Third part of awareness is say, okay, what am I saying to myself? Why do they do this? How come they always do these things? Why don't they ever listen? I'm asking a lot of lousy questions, because they may listen sometimes, but I'm saying they don't. I'm saying it with total intensity. Of course I'm going to feel bad. Let me change what I'm saying. Let me change what I'm asking. How can I turn this around? You know, what do I need to focus on to make this work? What's the truth here? You know, maybe I can't control it all, but I can control what it means to me. What does this really mean? If you just have that awareness and you break your pattern, you can get out of a negative emotion in a moment. Then you can say, well, how do I want to feel? To feel like that, what would I have to focus on right now? What would I have to believe? I have to believe, you know what, I can turn anything around. I may not like it, but I can make it happen. It's just another challenge that God's given me to sculpt my soul. Throw it at me. That's what this is about. Now, here's what you can do that'll make this part of your life. You make it a simple ritual. When you use the word ritual, some people think of something religious or something, you know, hocus pocus. Rituals, a simple word for rituals would be habits. But I think rituals is better because every person has rituals whether they know it or not. In fact, your rituals equal your results. If you look at your life and let's say your body is not where it wants to be, I promise you, whether you know it or not, you got rituals. What do you do? You start your day the same way each day. I'm sure you start your day by first going on a wrong walk or exercise approach. You eat really consciously. That's why you're overweight, right? Wrong. You know, you may be starting off at Starbucks, you know, and then you're going for that muffin. And then you're rushing off and not really taking care of yourself. And so your body never gets the right start. And 
What do you end up doing when you get to the office? You have a set of rituals. Whenever people are failing, they have rituals that cause them to fail, cause them to fail to achieve what they want. Listen, if you come home and the first thing you do when you go home is you go straight into turning on your email, you know, and flip it on, or you flip on the news in the background, and you do all these different things, if the first thing you don't do, people have rituals in their relationships. What's yours? What's the first thing you do consistently each day when you go home? I know every day is different, but there are some overall patterns, aren't there? I mean, people who have a great relationship have a very different ritual than people that don't. You know, there may be people that love each other, but there's no passion because what's the first thing they do? Their ritual is come home, hey, honey, a little kiss on the cheek, and then boom, go straight and turn on the email. Or boom, go and turn on the news or something in the background. Or say, you know, I got to go take a break right now. They don't connect. They don't have some ritualistic way to connect that produces energy and excitement or playfulness or fun. You meet a couple that are really in love. They have fun things. I mean, the first thing I do, and I'm not saying we're the ideal, but this is the weird thing we do. I come home, the first thing happens is the door close, I go, Lucy! <laughs> you know, because I remember as a kid watching Lucy and Arnaz, and sure enough, you know, I love Lucy. My wife is a crazy mofo. My wife is a crazy nut, right? That's why we're made for each other. And, you know, it, it creates a different tone, a different energy. And then oftentimes we do different things, but all of a sudden I'll say, where are you? You know, and she'll hide. Or she'll come running at me, you know, like, you know, you, we haven't seen each other for years, you know, playfully, we hug and twirl. We do this stuff all the time. I mean, I'm making this up. You talk, people go to my personal assistant very often, and the most common question she gets, she tells Sage and I is, you know, I've seen them in the seminars, I've seen this environment. I mean, they're not like that really all the time, are they? I mean, that's how bad our society has become, because most people's rituals do not produce playfulness. They don't produce passion. They don't produce sensuality or teasing or flirting. You know, it happens with somebody at work, but maybe not with a person you're in love with at home. See, rituals shape your life. So what this is about is discovering a set of rituals that will make you stronger for every area of your life. But I want this also to become kind of a trigger for you to say, okay, if I'm not thrilled with a certain part of my life, what's my ritual in that area of my life? What are my financial rituals? Is it avoidance? You know, do I really get focused on it? Do I pay attention to it? Because if it's not working, you got the wrong ritual. Find someone who's succeeding and find out what they do differently and do that, and your life will change. That's the essence that we're starting with. So we're going to give you a simple, fundamental ritual we call the hour of power, or 30 minutes to thrive, because everybody's got 30 minutes, or at least 15 minutes to be fulfilled. So what does it look like? Here's what it is simply. At the end of the session, there's another CD you can actually take with you on a walk. You can go and make this process happen, and I'll guide you through it in case you forget how this works, but it's pretty simple. It has three parts. Here's what you're going to do. The first step is that you want to make sure that the moment you wake up in the morning, there's no hesitancy to get up, so you start to train your body, which is training your mind. Remember, your body and mind are linked. Whatever you do with your body, it's going to affect your mind. You want to train your body to jump out of bed immediately with energy, without hesitancy, and to start moving. Because remember, emotion comes from motion. We've got to move. Now, ideally, you would exercise in the morning. There's a lot of reasons to do that because of all the times. And by the way, I'm a night person, so I understand if you go morning, well, I ain't jumping out of bed in the morning. I turn on around midnight or 1 in the morning, and sometimes I don't go to bed to 4 or 5. So what I'm talking about, you can adapt, but just hear me out. The ideal time to work out is in the morning because if you exercise in the morning, you turn on your metabolism, and you have it for the whole day. If you don't exercise, you get no metabolism and you just keep gaining fat and your body loses its strength and you lose muscle every single year, especially as you age. But if you can train yourself to do that in the morning is the first thing. Even if you have to get up earlier or go to bed slightly earlier or just take one hour less sleep or 30 minutes less sleep or 15 minutes less sleep, if you can do that in the morning, you turn on the metabolism, but you also turn on your emotions. Movement and breath are the first phase. So what you're going to do, have your shoes beside your bed, and if you've got somebody to do this with, it's even better. I mean, if you've got your lover and the first thing you do is get up in the morning and you can spend time walking with them, that's great. But you get up and you physically move. You go for a walk. Anywhere. You get outside. You get out of the house. You move immediately. Now, walking doesn't sound very dynamic, and you may want to run, but you walk first to start warming up your body, warming up your metabolism. And as you're walking, there's a pattern of breathing that when you do it, it will stimulate your body to cleanse itself, and it'll start to move everything you need. And the ratio of breath is you're inhaling four breaths in a row, so it's... And then you're exhaling four in a row. As you're doing this, you're actually going to be tapping fingers. You'll be doing this same pattern again and again. Shh, 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 shh. 
This pattern of breathing will alter your state. You will literally, after doing this for about five minutes, begin to feel radically different. Now, you're going to inhale through your nose, as you probably heard, and exhale out your mouth. And this is something called breath walking. There have been studies done on this at MIT, and it literally alters brain functioning. But you don't have to know the studies to be able to feel what it does in your system. So all you're going to do is, for the first five minutes, enjoy yourself. Get up. You don't have to worry about, oh, i got to run right now. My back's sore. You just get up, and you start to walk. You walk for about five minutes with this breathing pattern. Step two, you get grateful and you begin to visualize. So in phase two, what you're going to do now is you're going to cultivate the emotion of gratitude. What you're going to do very simply is, remember I said fear disappears when you're grateful. The minute you're grateful, you're rich. When you have everything in your life to be grateful for and you don't feel that emotion, you got nothing. You're poor. So this has to be a daily emotion. It's like the antidote to all the stress, the antidote to all the frustration. But you've got to cultivate it because if you go into a state of depression on a regular basis, pretty soon your body goes there automatically because it's conditioned, it's trained. It's like what we call anchoring it by going into that physiology, by breathing and by visualizing. So what you're going to do is you're going to focus on and ask yourself, what are all the things in my life I'm grateful for while you walk? So you're outdoors, you're moving, so your pattern of physiology makes you feel good. Now, as you're moving, you think about everything you're grateful for. And I usually start with a circle. I start with myself right here and my wife, Sage. And I think about all the things I'm grateful to God for in my life, my health. I start to think immediately, okay, my family members, and I think about them, and I send love to them. I make this spiral of thought going out. And then I think about my close friends and my close business associates, and then all the people I get to serve through my work in the world. And I just expand it. You think of moments you're grateful for. You know, a moment that I had with my son where he shared something with me that just made me cry. It was so beautiful. You know, there are moments in your life. So what are we doing? We're moving and breathing. That's changing your physiology. We're being grateful. That's a focus. And so now you change your focus. And now what you focus on is everything that you really want in your life, but you focus on it from a state as if it's already been achieved. I honestly start just giving thanks for it as if it's done. I am so grateful that that business deal has come together the way it has. So what I do is I begin to see it as if it's already done. Because remember, your brain can't tell the difference between something you vividly imagine and something you actually experience. So I see it. I feel it. I think about it. I feel the emotion as if it's already achieved. The more you can program your body and your mind and your emotions that something's achieved, your brain can do things you're unaware of. And if you focus on what you want continuously, you'll move towards it. Whatever you focus on, you move towards. Most people are focused on what they're afraid of. So as an example, when somebody's out of control in a car, they immediately look at the wall they don't want to hit. And, of course, as they look at it, they steer right into it. The same thing happens in life. Wherever you focus, that's where you go. Don't focus on what you fear. Focus on what you want and make it real. The more certain you are that what you want can happen, the easier it is for your brain to figure a way. When you say this is important, your brain starts noticing anything that will get you to what's important. And if you believe it's already happened, you know enough about life that when you have that kind of certainty, your brain will find the way. Now you start focusing on today. What do you want to create today? You think about meetings you're going to have. What do you want to make that happen? Instead of going, oh, i got to go to this meeting, what do I want? Most people think about what they have to do. Think about what you want to do. Who do you want to turn on, excite, make happy? Who do you want to make laugh? What do you want to achieve there? What do you want to accomplish? See, the more you can see it in advance, you've got to remember, everything that's in your outside world started in your inside world. Everything in my life, my kids, my businesses, this conversation with you started as something in my head, and now it's real. The same is true for you. You've got to create in your head first the way you want it if you want it to show up in your life the way you want it. Most people create in their head what they don't want, and so, of course, they keep manifesting what they don't want. So even for this day now, focus on what do you want to create out of this day. Think about what's coming up. How do you want it to go? How do you want to feel? How could you respond? And just get yourself juiced about the day. So now what you need to do is incantations. So if you're walking, as you're walking, you can be doing this. You can even be doing it with the same breath you started with, where you can be going, I love my life. I love my life. I love my life. You go, that sounds so positive, thinky tone. But you know what? If you do it over and over again, you're going to be vibrating. I've done incantations my entire life. It's how I've conditioned myself. 25 years ago, when I first started speaking, I was 17 years old. I'd make some changes in my life really quickly, and I started sharing it. And I didn't have speaking skills. But I had a state. You know when you're in state and things just flow? It's just like having a conversation. You don't have to think about it. It comes out of you.
but I made myself get in state because I was fearful. So I said, I got to focus on how to serve, not on am I going to do a good job. I need to focus on giving, not on how am I going to do. If you focus on how you're going to do, you're going to get worried. So I created an incantation, and I've done it for 25 years before I go on stage every single time. If anyone's been backstage, they'll see what I do. I make a big change in my body, take an explosive breath, and I do this thing I call a power move that stimulates my body so I'm at the strongest state I can be. Second thing I do is I do my incantation. And what I do is I say this. I say, I now command my subconscious mind to direct me in helping as many people as possible today to better their lives by giving me the strength, the emotion, the persuasion, the humor, the brevity, whatever it takes to show these people and get these people to change their life now. And I do it again and again and again. Now I can do it once today, and I'm there because I used to do this literally for 45 minutes driving someplace. I'm driving my old Volkswagen Bug. I'm supposed to do this speech to share with people how they can do these things. Or I'm supposed to meet this person one-on-one. -on -one. And I would literally chant this out loud. Now, why do you do it out loud? Because if you go in your head, that doesn't affect you. Speaking engages your physiology. And when you speak with certainty and intensity, it conditions you. So the bottom line is you do this while you walk. So if you're conscious about this, you can do it under your breath, like I said. You can do it in a breathing pattern. You can do something simplistic like, you know, every day and every way I'm getting stronger and stronger as you're jogging, as you're walking. Every day and every way I'm getting stronger and stronger. Some old phrase from an old book from years ago. Anything will work as long as you say it with intensity. Every day and every way I'm feeling happier and happier. Every day. And you say it again and again. And what you'll actually get is a rhythm. I'll tell you what incantations do in case this sounds stupid to you. Maybe it'll help. Have you ever made the fatal mistake of going to Disneyland? and getting on a ride called It's a Small World After All. If you have, you know the power of incantations, because what's stuck in your head for the next three weeks? That song in 37 languages, right? Or if you hear a song and you get it in your head and you can't get it out, you know, and it goes on and on and on, well, this is a way to get the right idea in your head and condition it, but not just the idea, the feeling. So now what you need to do is exercise, ideally 20 minutes, no less than 15 30 even better, and if you can do 45 minutes, that's wonderful, and that's how you get to the hour. And so at the end of this hour of power, you want to celebrate. You want to say, my God, I got myself to do this thing that set me up for victory. Now, you won't have to work at celebrating, I promise you. You'll feel so good, you'll be vibrating, especially if you did the incantations. Now, this process, you might say, well, I'm not going to run five times a week. and I'm, You don't have to. You can just go on a walk. And you can do this process, this hour of power of focus, and you can spend 10 minutes on gratitude. 10 minutes on visualizing, 10 minutes on what you want to have happen today, and do it in 30 minutes. This is your freedom. But I can tell you, if you'll give yourself an hour where 15 or 20 of those minutes are based on these three things, massive changes in your physiology that make you feel great, massive changes in your focus that make you focus specifically on gratitude and specifically on what you want to have happen and feeling like it's already been achieved, and then massive changes where you push your body to be stronger and you make some incantations, you say some phrases over and over, at least five or ten minutes of it, you will have conditioned your mind, your body, your emotions, and your spirit will soar. And now you will deal with problems radically differently. There won't be problems, there will be challenges for you. And more importantly, you'll be excited to connect with people. You'll be excited about your projects. You will affect people around you in a different way because you will have an extraordinary psychology. Now, by the way, these... These fundamental rituals, they really come down once again to doing something to change your body, something to change your focus, something to change your language. And where did I come up with this? Well, the biggest changes of my entire life have always been engaging those three forces. I mean, I called it the triad then or the hour of power, but these are the things that changed me. When I was in my very early stage of my life and my mother and father got in this major conflict and my mom got really upset, so she kicked my father out and... Uh, you get a sense of who was the power in the relationship by that description, don't you? But the bottom line is she thought I was on his side, so I went out next. And it was Christmas Eve, and I had to figure out how to survive. And so one of the things I did was I stayed at some friends' houses. I dealt with, you know, I, I lived a pretty intense and crazy life at that stage. I was 17 years old, and I was working as a janitor. And I worked in a place called San Marino, California, and I was living in a city called Azusa. I was still in high school, and I would literally take buses to be able to get to this place in San Marino, I worked with two banks, Security Pacific Bank and Lloyd's. And I literally, I loved being a janitor because I could work in the middle of the night and you got paid for results. 
you know, instead of lollygagging along, man, I kicked butt. I went in there, put, you know, the equivalent of my iTunes on. But in those days, it was this big eight-track portable player. <laughs> that shows you how ancient I am. But I carried it around from room to room, and, man, I just kicked butt. And I got through that thing. You know, they gave me six hours to do, and I think I used to do it, if I remember right, like in three and a half or four. But it took hours to get there, hours to get back. Not just one bus, but I had to make connections on them. So long story short, I'm doing this. I'm not getting much sleep and getting up in the morning, going to school, and and I'm burning out, but I'm still sticking with it. And I'm upset with my mom because I feel like she is not listening to me. And frankly, this is not an attack on my mom. Thank God she did this. This made me so strong. At the time, I hated her guts, honestly. But, you know, she she was pushing me in ways I didn't really realize at the time. You know, you don't always understand as a kid. I just had my own story about it. But all I knew was I was trying to survive. And the bottom line of the story, and the reason I'm telling you this in terms of rituals is this. You know, I'd finish maybe 1.30, 1 o'clock in the morning, and then I'd get out there and I'd jump on that late night bus and start the long journey home. Well, interestingly enough, on this night, I get out there. I'm waiting for the bus, waiting for the bus, waiting for the bus, and I'm going, I know I didn't miss it. And I kept my eye out on it because, you know, I couldn't afford to miss the bus. It's the only bus till morning or, you know, I don't know when, hours and hours later. I never discovered that, but I knew I had to be on that bus. And nothing came. An hour went by and nothing came. An hour and a half went by. Now I'm at, I don't know the real time. I can't remember, honestly, but somewhere around 2.30, 3 in the morning, and I'm freaking out. And so sure enough, guess what? Somebody comes by and goes, hey, kid, what are you doing? And I said, what are you talking about? This man, he said, you know, the buses aren't coming because I was sitting on the bench. He said, there's a bus strike. So what do you do? You know, I didn't have any friends with cars. I couldn't, quote, call home and get a lift. So I finally thought, I got to get home. And I started walking. I thought, at this pace of walking, I am never going to get there. So inside of me, something just snapped. Something got mad. Something got intense. And what I started to do was started to jog. I thought, I can't jog all this way home. And then something inside of me went, you're going to find the way. You're going to find the way. And I started doing these incantations. In those days, I'd just started reading these books on programming my mind, some of those old basic books. And I started, as I was jogging, going, every day in every way, I'm getting stronger and stronger. Every day in every way, I'm getting stronger and stronger. And then after doing this over and over again, it became like an addiction. You ever had one of those songs get stuck in your head? You know, did you ever make that fatal mistake of going to Disneyland and riding on that ride called It's a Small World After All? And then that song is stuck in your head for like next three weeks in 167 languages. Well, this can happen in a positive way. This incantation, I kept changing. I'm getting healthier and healthier. I'm getting stronger and stronger. Honestly, I think in the very beginning, I went, I'm going to show her. I'm going to show her. You know, it was anger initially, honestly. I'm going to show my mom she can't stop me kind of thing. And then it converted into joy. I ran from San Marino to Azusa. How long is that accurately? I can't tell you to the exact mile, but it's roughly 12 miles. I'd never run three miles in my life. But I want to tell you something. At the end of that run, I never felt stronger in my entire life. I felt like I could storm through anything. Nothing was going to stop me. And that created a whole new momentum in my life. And what was it? Physiology, focus, and language at the most intense level. And literally to this day, when I have faced things in my life over the last 20, 30 years, I can pull back up that moment, that experience, without even thinking about it. It almost gave me, it's like it made that fundamental muscle. Now, after that time in my life, my life started to take off. And eventually, obviously, mended things with my mom and my family, and everything became beautiful. And equally importantly, I grew as a man. I wasn't a stupid boy who was just focused on himself. I really started to shift how I could contribute, how I could grow, how I could make a difference. And in a short period of time, at a very young age, here I was, you know, a very successful young man. I was written up in newspapers and magazines. My nickname was Wonder Boy. My ego started to grow real big, you know. And the interesting thing happened was I then got beyond my comfort zone. I started feeling that third pillar. I didn't call it then, but I started feeling these inner conflicts. I mentioned this when I talked to you a little bit in that first session on decisions and destiny, but I found myself in a place where I was making a lot of money. And I grew up very poor. And I had this blueprint, this mindset that said, man, you know, I've gone through, you know, three divorces with my mom. I've seen these men come and go. All of those arguments were based on financial stress. That's the story I had in my head. Obviously, it was more than that. They had conflicts in their values and their beliefs, but I simplified it to that. So I thought, man, if I can earn enough money, I can make everybody happy. Love will be there. But it's not what happened. I went back and started hanging out with my friends, and all of a sudden, they started like, yeah, you got money now. And 
I had all this judgment. I was never doing it for money. I was doing it because I want to make a difference. And I wanted to have some financial freedom too. So you know what I started doing? I started to sabotage myself. I didn't do it consciously. I did it unconsciously. Started not showing up for key meetings. Started showing up late. You know, started snapping at people. And I'm a loving guy. And I feel bad about it. And then I'd apologize to the person, but then I'd go do it again. It was like unconsciously. I wanted to get back to where I knew everybody would be okay with me. They'd be okay if I was successful, but not too financially successful. And the bottom line is, you know, if you've heard the story of my life before, you know, people come up and say, you know, how did you change your life? You know, when you're back there in Venice, that's where I was. I lost everything financially. I moved into this cheap little, you know, one room bachelor apartment, not a bedroom, just one room. I was living in that room. I had my little cooking plate I had. I used to wash my dishes in the bathtub. 2516 Pacific Avenue, apartment 3A. Have you ever going to check it out? <laughs> I literally went back there years ago and knocked on the door to see who was living there and see if I could help him out, see if lightning could strike twice in the same place. That's a whole other story I'll tell you sometime. But the point is, I found myself in this place where I was waking up each day feeling sorry for myself. You know, my life was a mess. I was watching television all the time. I was eating to try and fill myself up because I wasn't filled up emotionally. And I gained 38 pounds in about two and a half months. And again, that's not easy to do. So, you know, what did I do? I kept eating and just not moving as much as possible. But what changed me was a series of events, one in particular, but a series of them that really made me feel humiliated, made me look at my life and say, man, somewhere inside of me, I know I'm more than what I'm demonstrating mentally and emotionally and physically and financially and spiritually. And the day that all snapped for me, the way I changed it was with the same ritual. I didn't think about it consciously. I just went, look, I got this big gut. I got no energy. I feel like I got no control over my life. So I decided I was going to go on a run. Now, going on a run is not something I'd done for several years at that point, at least a year and a half. And I had this big gut. And so I put on, in those days, what used to be known as a Walkman. Don't know if you're ancient enough to remember those as well. You can see how I was moved from 8-tracks all the way into the Walkman. This giant little device with a headphone. And I remember I played some music from a group called Heart. Do you remember them? They had a song called Barracuda. And I got on that beach and I ran as hard as I could humanly run until I felt like I was going to spit up blood and I kept on doing it. I didn't know what I was doing at the time, but you know what I was doing. I was making a big change in my physiology. And I used the music to put myself in a peak state of focus. And when I was done, I took out this journal. I wrote a line down the middle of the page. And on one side, I wrote everything I was committed to having in my life. Everything. And the other side, I wrote everything I'm committed to not having in my life, which is most of how I was living. The relationship I was in, the way I was living physically, the way I was financially. I didn't even know how I was going to change. But I had an absolute vision for what I wanted. I was in a peak state physically, and I started doing incantations. I started doing these. I started going, God's wealth is circulating in my life. His wealth flows to me in avalanches of abundance. All my needs, desires, and goals are met instantaneously by infinite intelligence. For I am one with God, and God is everything. I remember it so vividly. I'm not looking at some script right now. I remember it vividly because I did it day after day after day. And I didn't just say these over and over again. I visualized God's wealth is circulating in my life. And I see the wealth of God coming to me in the form of love and joy and connection and making a difference. His wealth flows to me in avalanches of abundance. And I'd imagine avalanches of joy, of happiness, of impact, of money, of love, of fun, everything. I'd image it. I'd feel it in my body as it was happening. God's wealth is circling my life. His wealth flows to me in avalanches of abundance. All my needs, desires, and goals are met instantaneously by infinite intelligence. And I would say it with that intensity and see it. For I'm one with God and God is everything. Over and over and over and over again. Till I would wake up thinking these thoughts. God's wealth is circling my life. I would feel this connection to God. I'd feel this connection to nature. I'd feel a sense of abundance. And sure enough, Whatever you focus on, where focus goes, energy flows. I start looking for answers. What did I do? An hour of power. And I continue to do this today. Anytime I want to strengthen myself, and sometimes I'm not even trying to strengthen, I just want to get in the state of momentum, I go and do my hour of power. And I do it different ways, but it always includes a change in the physiology, my focus, my language, my sense of vision and gratitude. And I can do it at different times and create all kinds of variety and use music and elements, but it never leaves me. And by the way, I promised to tell you exactly what Pat Riley did. I said, you know, how did Pat, when he lost the second game of the NBA championship, two in a row, and he's looking at his players and he sees that they don't believe they can turn this around. And all the media is saying, 
Only two teams in history have ever been able to come back from zero and two and win the championship. And you know, you don't have a historic team here. It's not like you have the greatest players in the world on your team. He's hearing all this. How do you find a way to find that internal certainty that could get him to not only believe but do what's necessary to maximize his ability as a coach? How do you find enough certainty that he could transfer that to his team? He did his own version of our power. It does it to this day. Pat's way of doing it is he gets a little walk going, and then he does these yoga-like postures that cause him to make this radical change in the way that he's sitting, moving, breathing, and focusing. And then he starts to get visions. He starts to meditate, and he gets a vision for what he's really after, not what he's afraid of, what he wants. He asks quality questions that give him quality answers. And then, of course, he has his incantations for himself and for his team. They have a theme that they repeat again and again and again until it literally gets in their nervous system. One of Pat's most fundamental belief systems that he uses as an incantation with his teams as long as he was a coach was simply this. We are the best conditioned, strongest, toughest, most disliked team in the league. Because <laughs> he wanted to be so strong that they could face anything. And all these guys get that in their body day after day after day. But it was in one of these sessions that he got the insight to say, we are winning. He got the vision. We're going to win 12 days from today. And then his second hour of power, he got the insight. Okay. I'm going to get these guys to have certainty because I'm going to tell them they're only bringing one suit. We're not booking in any other hotel rooms, only one night. There isn't going to be a seventh game. We're winning on the sixth game, and we're even going to book the venue for victory here in Miami that night when we get home. I mean, I'm going to box us in. He got that out of an hour power. And then the sharing of the experience of Martin Luther King's writings that came on his third day of our power during this process. You want insights? You want an extraordinary body? It takes a ritual, doesn't it? A ritual of diet or a ritual of exercise. If you want an extraordinary emotion and spirit, it takes rituals. One of those that you might want to add to this hour of power is prayer. If you believe in prayer, this is it. This is a form of it. Maybe the greatest prayer is not asking for things, but saying, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Getting in that place on a daily basis for no less than 15 minutes to fulfillment and ideally the hour of power will change your life more than anything else. And if you did it for six months, your life will never be the same. Because all the research shows that if you even exercise for six months, you'll exercise for the rest of your life because it becomes physically addictive to you. If you get away from it, you'll feel pulled to do it. All you got to do right now is give it a week or 10 days. Do this with me for 10 days, and I promise you, you're going to get some momentum. And by the way, if you want to guarantee success, do it for 30. This process works. All you got to do is give yourself the gift of a little bit of time each day. Are you going to do it? Are you going to follow through? You bet you are. And I'll be with you each step of the way. Now, I know this audio session is much longer than any other, other than a workshop, because I really wanted to hopefully engage you. My goal was to do everything I could to get you to give yourself what you deserve and to tell you the three things that you've got to take control of and to remind you of the fundamentals that your life is nothing but your emotions. If you get the right emotions, you'll work out. If you're determined, you'll work out. You can change a state that fast, but you got to get the habit. Are you sold? I hope so, because the sale is for you. It's not for me. It's for you to create what you want long term. If you will do this, and you'll even do it four days a week, if you'll just get a habit that you'll commit to and not break, your pride will soar. Because when you just discipline yourself a tiny bit, and by the way, this doesn't feel like discipline. It feels like joy when you do it. But if you discipline yourself just a little bit, you get a positive habit you've consciously created, it spills over into all the areas of your life. So thank you for listening. And what I want you to do is, tomorrow I want you to go do this first thing in the morning. I want you to start out your day by doing this hour of power or this 30 minutes to thrive or these 15 minutes of fulfillment. Just do it. And by the way, if this sounds complex and I've overloaded you because it's been a long session, don't worry. I'll walk you through it fresh as we do it, but make sure you get started. The hardest part is the first step. The hardest part to get is momentum. So my friend, I plead with you. Give yourself this gift each day. I mean, this is really one of the most important decisions of your life. And I hope my crazy, outrageous approach pushed you in the right direction and didn't push you away. I hope somehow I found my way into your heart or your intellect or whatever part of you we've got to reach to push the button that launches your life to the next level, to the level it deserves to be. So this is the beginning of a brand new journey. And I'm really grateful that you've allowed me to be your coach in this first part of the process. I think we can make immense progress, so let's start taking real action. Let's not just talk a good game, you and I. Let's do it. Just get your butt out there, because once you get